I just went to Lisbon and got to sit down with the amazing team at Halborn and record an entire series on cloud hacking. So for the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be releasing weekly special episodes on cloud hacking, and it's going to be featuring some of their team members. And we're going to take a look at cloud infrastructure and kind of compare the Web 2 space to Web 3 and then look at vulnerabilities. And then later down the road, we're going to look at AWS specifically and also GCP and what are the different ways you can find vulnerabilities within those infrastructures and how to exploit them. But for this first episode, what we're going to do is we're just going to take a look at what is the Web3 infrastructure, what does Web3 look like, are they similar, are they different, does hacking it make a difference because it's Web2 and Web3, and hopefully we get to answer those by bringing on Carlos and Gabby into the episode and see what they have to say about that. Thank you guys for joining me. Um, before we jump into the video, I want to talk about cloud security. But before that, I kind of want to also understand what you guys do. What is your role at Halborn? What I you know, how did you guys get into what you do and do an introduction? And then I really want to kind of ask you guys questions about how cloud is and how is that with Web3. So maybe we'll start with you, Carlos. Yep, sounds good. Um, so, well, you know me, my name is Carlos Palov. I got in Halborn mainly because of Gabby. Uh, we have met each other some years ago in a master's. Uh, so he told me about this really, really, really nice company that was doing Web3 security, Harborn. And the thing is that uh, Web2 is still affecting so much, so much to Web3. Actually, we are going to be talking about some vulnerabilities of Web2 vulnerabilities that affected a lot Web3 companies. And, and I was so specialized in Web2 that he told me like, hey, why don't you come here to Harborn, join us as a leader of the web, mobile and cloud team. Uh, kind of all things related to off-chain and not on-chain security. And that's my main role here in Halborn. Nice. What about you, Gabby? Yeah, I'm Gabby. Uh, I'm the VP of security at Halborn. So I'm responsible for all the engineering part. So I'm in charge not only for the blue team, but also off-chain part and on-chain part. And we have another department called Special Ops. Is whatever is different. <laughs> So, you know, I was the first employee in Halborn, so I've been in Halborn for more than two years. Wow, very cool. So when it comes down to Web3, my understanding is like the, the blockchain itself, the transactions happen completely different, but I still see, you know, there's websites involved. There is um, the stack, I think it looks kind of the same as any other website. How is that? Is that so accurate? Are we still... Does Web3 rely on Web2, or are we completely cutting out Web2 eventually and hoping to never hear from it again? Um, from a Web2 guy perspective, I think Web3 is always going to be relying on Web2. Um, I find that at the end you need, at the, you are going to have this smart contract, you are going to have these blockchains, but obviously blockchains need to be run in some servers. As you say, you will need uh, web pages, you will need uh, some external databases and even users management, depending on what you are doing. Um, so there are some solutions, I believe, that are happening in Web3 in web to fix all these problems. But at the end, what I found is that all, at, at least today, all Web3 companies are still relying on Web2 um, services, traditional services, and therefore it's very, very important for a Web3 company to also check all the Web2 infrastructure they rely. I mean, even code repositories like GitHub, they still need this kind. And, and as you may know, a lot of uh, API keys may be leaked here. So this is a very good entry point for a Web3 company from a Web2 perspective. Right from a security perspective, is you know, are we going to see these Web3 companies, you know, these companies that are based on blockchain, their business is pretty much blockchain, is Web2 going to affect their security in any way? Yeah, at this point, it's like, uh, actually, we are a company for Web3, but we like to say, like, uh, we are a company for Web3, but we provide security as well, you know, all the Web2 part around the Web3, because it's like... Uh, the core, we can say the core is the smart contracts and the blockchain native things itself. But not only that, because you have, as Carlos said, you know, website, cloud, and so. And, and also it's curious because something as simple as uh, RPCs, is, this is Web2. <laughs> <It's like, laughs> so, for example, you are going to connect your MetaMask wallet in order to interact with the blockchain. And, you know, it's the same concept as in, in Web2. It's like you need the RPC to go through that. So attackers, they 
attacks on providers in terms of manipulate data, manipulate transactions, and the money involved there. I like that you mentioned providers. I also feel like all these different Web3 companies, they rely on these Web2 providers. You know, I say Web2, but it's like the, what the internet runs on, right? Like they, they use cloud providers, whether it's your AWS, whether it's GCP, whether you go digital ocean, whatever more you want to use, right? I feel like those companies still rely on um, the service providers, right? Is that the case when you, what you guys do with your pen tests and your customers? I have so much fun with that. <laughs> <laughs> No, for real, like um, when you're auditing, for example, a, a common Web3 company, AWS, so you start doing this hardening, you start checking all these services, all these configurations, and then you start checking, for example, environmental variable in different services, like in, in Docker, in ECS, or in Lambdas uh, functions. And you're going, like, I, I will say 60% of the time, here is the part where you're going to be finding hardcore AWS credentials. Um, hardcore GitHub credentials, some, some other platform credentials just in there, in clear text. And, and, and it's, a great way to, it's a great way in this case to pivot from, from AWS to other platforms or, or to previous. But in GitHub, as, we, as I told you before, um, fortunately this often happens in, in private repos. I have found uh, 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 some of them in, in public repos and that was pretty, pretty bad. Um, they always have the same problem is that they are leaking these credentials and because um, our company like this is this is pretty fun we are talking about web3 we are talking about decentralization but the what is happening in reality in the world is that people is centralizing more and more all the services they are using third-party platform they are using cloud providers um, all everything is running in the servers of a single company or a few companies and that's the problem with Web3 companies and Web2 companies. You are always going to find ways to compromise these, uh, their accounts in these other companies and to pivot. And even if you are a Web3 decentralized company, you still can be compromised this way. Yeah, that's the problem. It's like a Web3 is supposed to be decentralized. But, you know, whenever you put a cloud provider or something centralized, you are putting like patches in terms of... Uh, you know, making this running properly. So an another funny audit I had, it was, you know, the client had a bridge and, you know, in a bridge you have like a part A, part B, and you have a relayer in the middle in terms of, you know, uh, indexing transactions and so. So, you know, the client decided to put like a MongoDB database in the middle in order to index <laughs> transactions. So it was like you had a relayer, but you had the MongoDB as well. At the, at the end, it's like you stop the relayer, and if you started to launch transaction, MongoDB put on queue. And at the end, say, okay, why not changing the amount? Why not, you know, like a, putting like a valid transaction has? And when I set up the relayer again, all my transactions were processed on the other side. So it was an infinite minting with a Web2 thing, you know, with a simple database, right? Wow. So is it still common to see these Web2 phones play a huge role of how these companies are being, or not companies, but these smart contracts or exchanges are becoming vulnerable? There's still the, you know, it's still database vulnerabilities. It's logical database vulnerabilities because of transactions, right? Yeah. But it's still relying on the same concept of what you do for Web2 with like OWASP top 10, right? Yeah, that's it. It's like, uh, because uh, as I said before, it's like uh, ideally it's, everything decentralized, but it's not true. It's like uh, they need the cloud, they need, you know, this web provider, they need, they trust AWS or maybe Cloudflare or whatever. It's like because the system, you know, the Web3 space is not ready yet for being completely decentralized. So at the end, you, you have to trust this kind of Web2 things. Yeah, and we are talking, we have been mostly focusing maybe in Web2 in clouds and web. Don't forget about mobile application like yeah. wallets. Like, man, you have your money in there and they are still vulnerable to common uh, mobile vulnerabilities. So it's another way to still charge your funds. And this is happening a lot um, with this, um, uh, I don't know how it's called, but this malware that will steal all your private keys from your computer or from your mobile phone and just steal your funds. Um, I'm definitely not defending centralized banks because they do things more secure in this case. But um, it's still very easy to just get uh, compromised some computer, steal these uh, keys, and then you steal all the funds. 
So for people that have been watching, we did a crypto series. We called it the crypto series. It was around smart contracts. I had a few other people from Halborn join me to teach me, like, how do you approach a smart contract, right? But when it comes down to security of the assets at a core, the advice here is go learn those old school vulnerabilities, the server side vulnerabilities mostly, if you want to get in the business of pen testing the entire infrastructure, right? It's a very good question, at least. Uh I think a little bit more complex than that. Um, the thing is that in a complete infrastructure, there are a lot of things happening and a lot of things related. Uh, you need to have a complete understanding of how is everything working and how is everything meant to work. And obviously you need to understand how are all the platforms that are in, in place uh, working. So if you have AWS working along with Okta, working along with GitHub, something that you really need to know as pen tester is how they have integrated all of them which permissions have each person have, and the only way to do that is the, the client giving you access to all these platforms. This is something that, that we definitely do at Harbor. And um, once you know how is everything working together, you need to talk to the client like, how do you think this is really working? Because then that, that's the moment where you start uh, finding that, hey, they have assigned this group in Okta uh, admin privilege over AWS because only a couple of guys will be here but actually the whole company is giving access to this, to this role. And usually, well, clients, uh, some clients I have talked to talk to us, they say like, no, I only, I want you just to review this AWS because 90% of our infrastructure is here. And you will see just that there are some permissions being assigned all around the place, but because you cannot access Okta, GitHub, and, and well, other platforms, you don't really see all, all these problems. So you need to understand all these uh, third-party infrastructure uh, service providers, how they work, how they can give privilege to each other. Then you need to understand mobile web vulnerabilities, uh, all was top 10, all the traditional hacking. And then you really need to understand how the internals of cloud is working. Because there are, um, there are unexpected permissions, unexpected ways you can use to exfiltrate credentials, to escalate privilege. Yeah. So it's like a huge magnets of things that are quite easy for someone that has been doing hacking for several years. But if you miss some of the pieces, you are definitely going to be missing really, uh, important information to discover vulnerabilities. Uh, at the end, it's like uh, annoying things uh, trigger these kind of things, not only for users, but also for, for, also for developers, you know, <laughs> like, uh, you know, the company is like, yeah, but, you know, it's more comfortable to give permissions to anyone because if not, it's, it's someone is on holidays or whatever. And the same case is with the user, you know, when you have to sign a transaction, uh, you know, even if you have your hardware wallet connected to your MetaMask, at the end it's like a, a lot of clicks and say, oh, it, you know, last time it was two, maybe three, because you are signing something extra. But you know, if the user realizes which kind of things he signed, even with a physical thing, you know, it's the case of the Badger DAO attack. It's like the attacker put an extra uh, sign, an extra approval in the front end, and the user didn't know anything and approved transactions, <coughs> and the attacker started to drain a lot of funds, hunting $120 million. <laughs> wow. So, uh, yeah, I think everything I'm getting is like the context of how you're doing things makes a difference, mm -hmm. but it's just at the core of it, we're still are looking at the same things that we looked at in Web2, vulnerabilities are almost the same. The structures are, and the infrastructure is similar, but it's just the context makes a huge difference on how things are integrated. I think it's a good place for us to kind of end there because I do want to talk about like Web2 vulnerabilities that have kind of played a role in like the blockchain breaches, but maybe we can do it in another episode, in the next episode. People that are watching this, if you want to come back and learn more about uh, the vulnerabilities that affect Web3, but they're still like the, the old, you know, server side vulnerabilities, that'll be the next episode. Okay, that's it. As you can see, Web 2 and Web 3 are not really that different. Next, we're gonna also have our guests, Gabby and Carlos, and we're gonna take a look at the different attacks that either Halborn has found during their pen test or some of the common vulnerabilities they have seen maybe in the news or they read an article somewhere or they've just again they have done it themselves and kind of look at these different vulnerabilities and understand the threat model around these web3 projects when it comes down to cloud hacking so i will see you all next week for a brand new episode on cloud hacking